Welcome to the City Club of Portland, Oregon's premier citizens forum. We're delighted you're with us today. I'm Don Williams, president of City Club. Our program today is entitled Hot Town Summer in the City, Climate Change in Oregon's Past, Present and Future. Our speakers are three accomplished geologists who know Oregon's record of past and present climate change. They will address examples related to their research teaching and policy interests. Today's moderator will be City Club member Richard Ross, president of the Oregon Paleo Lands Institute. For the benefit of our radio and television audiences, please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices. There will be no Friday forums during the month of August. We would like to thank you, however, for your strong support of City Club programs during the last year. In fact, our attendance at Friday forums during the summer month of July has averaged over 200 people. This is a tribute to the spirit of civic engagement in Portland. We also greatly appreciate and want to acknowledge our broadcasting partners, and they, those are Oregon Public Broadcasting, KPBS, Portland Community Media, and PAX Television. Thanks to them, thousands of additional people get to listen to or view Friday forums of the City Club. Please join us on September 7th, which is the beginning of our fall season. Our first speaker will be Bob Berdahl, who's president of the American Association of American Universities. He will speak on privatization for the public good. First, a few announcements. In about four hours, we would like you to join us for City Club's final Friday. It's a great way to network and meet other City Club members to wind down the week and discuss today's program. City Club members and their guests are invited to drop by the City Club Commons from 4.30 to 6 p.m. The event is free, it's open to the public, and reservations are not required. We would like you to make a reservation if you're planning to attend um, a city, an event at the City Club Commons on Tuesday, July 31st at 5.30, which is a panel discussion on the Portland Development Commission. It will include current chair Mark Rosenbaum and two past directors, board chairs of the Portland Development Com Commission, Elaine Kogan and John Russell. Members of the panel have helped guide development in Portland since the 1970s and they have decades of PDC governance experience. The moderator will be Dr. Nohad Toulon, who is the founding dean of PSU's College of Urban and Public Affairs. New members, City Club membership continues to grow, and if you read the bulletin, I think you'll be impressed as I am with the range of occupations represented by our new members. If you act by the end of August, you still have a chance to take advantage of our special incentive. Join by August 31st, and you won't need to renew until October of 2008. Margaret Eichmann is in the back of the room with the details. Margaret, you want to raise your hand, so uh, take advantage of that. And please join me in welcoming our new City Club members today. And I'll uh, read the list, and they'll stand, and please hold your applause until all are introduced. First, Brooke Nelson, Communications Coordinator with the Energy Trust of Oregon. Cliff Womax, who's a retired attorney. Nancy Congdon, Senior Financial Advisor, Ameriprise Financial. Gina Franzosa, Cascadia Region Green Building Council. Jeffrey Hunker, who's uh, from Carne Carnegie Mellon University, Professor of Technology and Public Policy, and Steve Katz, who's a citizen. Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> Recently, you received an email from the City Club regarding a member survey, and this is an attempt for us to learn how you view our programs and give suggestions on how City Club can improve its service. The survey was sent to over 3,000 members, past members, and people who have attended programs recently. 
We want to thank the 400 people who have already responded, and if you haven't yet taken the survey, please check your email box. I might add that I took the survey this morning, and it's quick and very easy to answer. If you didn't receive it, you can go to the City Club's website and find it on the home page or speak to Kim or Margaret on the City Club staff. The survey deadline is soon. It's next Wednesday, August 1st, and what we'll be doing is posting the results on our or reporting our findings in the fall. We're fortunate to have terrific corporate sponsors for this program, and this quarter's sponsors are Zimmer, Zimmer Gunsel Frasca Architects and Stoll Reeves LLP. In fact, we have three tables of Stoll Reeves attorneys and personnel, and please join me in thanking them for their generosity. I'm going to also add that we have uh, four visitors today from San Diego who are sitting over there if they want to stand up. Um, these are people from the San Diego Regional Economic Development Corporation. And they're meeting with key civic leaders and organizations for a uh, best practices seminar. Global warming. Where does one who wants to learn more about this topic obtain information about this critical issue? Well, if one does a Google search on the web, like I did, he or she can choose from 87,450,201 hits identified under the topic. Someone might also suggest checking with the state of Oregon's climatologist. But wait! That route would also not be fruitful because this position no longer exists. The person filling this non-existent position did have some controversial views on global warming, and this in part may have led to some changes which you probably read about earlier this week. What about policymakers? Well, one should also probably avoid drawing conclusions from the statements of politicians as exemplified by these two examples. The first is by Senator Inhofe of Oklahoma. He's the former chair of the Senate Committee on Environment and his position, and I quote, "Madmade global warming is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Conversely, former Vice President Al Gore stated, the scientists are virtually screaming from the rooftops now. The debate is over. There's no longer any debate in the scientific community about this. But the political systems around the world have held global warming at arm's length because it's an inconvenient truth. Today, we're fortunate to have three geologists who do have the expertise to give us facts and insight about global warming in an Oregon context. Oregon's geologic record and the global record over the last 700 million years provide insight to both the processes and the consequences of climate change. There are lessons to learn from the geologic record of the past and the geology of the present. Together, they make climate change an issue we can't afford to ignore. Our moderator, Richard Ross, has been board president of Oregon Paleo Lands Institute in Fossil, Oregon since 2002. The Institute, with local and federal partners, has developed education programs and a field center. It showcases the world-renowned natural history of John Day Fossil Beds region and helps renew its frontier rural communities. Richard has developed and led community plans and organizations in the Portland and rural region since 1972. He was community planning manager for the city of Gresham from 1995 to 2002 and Gresham's lead transportation planner for the eight years prior to that position. He led a series of innovative and nationally recognized projects while at Gresham, including the 4.5 mile Springwater Corridor, which is Oregon's first urban rail trail. He 
He also taught secondary school history, social studies, and environmental field studies. And of course, he's been a City Club member since 2005. He graduated with a degree in history from Middlebury College in Vermont and holds a Master of Urban Planning degree from Portland State University and an MAT from Reed College. He and his wife live in Portland and also manage the Mul I knew I was going to mispronounce that, Muleshoe Greek Ranch on the John Day River in Willer County. Please, reckon, rec please join me in welcoming Richard Ross and our panel. Uh, thank you, Don. Before uh, I get started here, I wanted to mention you have a little souvenir here uh, on your table. It's a bookmark with 400 million years of Oregon climate change and extinction. So please uh, take them with you um, to start our forum. Uh, I want you to think about rapid climate change. Consider the year 1816, the famous year without a summer. Mount Tambora and the East Indies spewed massive amounts of volcanic dust into the atmosphere throughout the northern hemisphere. Skies were dark, crops failed, storms raged, hundreds of thousands died in food shortages or migrated. But that gloomy summer forced three talented young writers to take refuge in a villa on Lake Geneva, Switzerland. Here they challenged each other to write the scariest story. 19-year-old Mary Shelley was the winner. Her masterpiece, Frankenstein, is a planetary tale for our times. Frankenstein is a prophecy of how technology and progress can turn on its human makers in monstrous ways as we alter the natural order. Scientific Americans, August 2007, lead article agrees with this. Titled The Undeniable Case for Global Warming, it concludes, we are now living in an era in which both humans and nature affect the future evolution of the Earth and its inhabitants. Oregon is one of the best places, as Don has mentioned, to explore the Earth's past and future evolution. The John Day Basin holds the most complete record of life for the last 50 million years, and the Oregon Paleo Lands Institute, our, today's co-presenter, is building sustainable tourism in the small rural gateway communities to the John Day fossil beds. Our home base is remote and rural and rugged Wheeler County, uh, one of Oregon's least populated and least prosperous counties. But with our partners, we are tackling three top Oregon challenges. First, understanding our remarkable landscape and our changing climates, past, present, and future. Next, reconnecting adults and kids with the natural world through our hands-on Oregon adventures trips, natural history programs for kids, and our upcoming field center. And then bridging Oregon's urban-rural divide and supporting our rural communities. Our board is a statewide group formed under the Oregon Solutions uh, Program. And I want to mention, uh, we have a couple of board members here today. If they could stand up or raise their hands, Vicki McConnell and Sandra Saran. Uh, and I don't know if we have any others. Uh, but in any case, uh, there are a couple of our members from the Portland region. Uh, we're, uh, thanks to the Meyer Trust, we were able to hire our first staff, Ellen Bishop, in 2006. And this year, we've opened a Paleo Lands bookstore in Fossil. And thanks to Congress and Senator Wyden, we will open a new field center in 2008 in Fossil. So if you're interested in taking an Oregon Adventures trip, our latest mini catalog is out on the back tables, or if you want to get involved in our work or, or simply visit the John Day Basin, uh, check out the back tables or our brand new website that launches today called paleolands.org. You can also contact our executive director, Ellen Bishop, or myself. But as we like to say in the Oregon Outback, our future is in the rocks. To help us understand that idea, we welcome a distinguished panel of Oregon geologists today. Uh, in the middle is Vicki McConnell, Oregon State geologist, and the director of the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. Part of her vision is to partner with rural communities and encourage innovative and sustainable use of their natural resources including fossils. Vicki has conducted geologic research and mapping projects all across Oregon uh, and 
has focused on groundwater, watershed recharge, and geological hazards. She was recently featured in a front page story in the Oregonian about earthquake hazards to schools. That caught our attention. Dr. McConnell received her PhD in geology uh, from the University of Alaska. Ellen Morris Bishop, uh, on my left here, is the executive director of the Oregon Paleo Lands Institute. She's an accomplished geologist, educator, photographer, and writer. Ellen has spent more than two decades in research of Oregon's landscapes. Her latest book, In Search of Ancient Oregon, won the 2004 Oregon Book Award for Nonfiction. Uh, she has written several popular guides, including Hiking Oregon's Geology and our family favorite, Best Hikes with Dogs in Oregon. <laughs> Dr. Bishop received a PhD in geology from Oregon State University. And finally, on my far left is Ann Nolan, Associate Professor at Oregon State University in the Department of Geosciences. Her research focuses on snow, glaciers, climate change, and water resources. Anna spent field sessions on the Greenland ice sheet and the Mount Hood glaciers. She is Associate Director of the Water Resources Graduate Program and an expert reviewer for the 2007 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Dr. Nolan received her PhD in geography from the University of California. Our first panelist to speak will be Vicki McConnell. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard, for an excellent introduction. And there, there we go. Thank you, Richard, for that excellent introduction. And I also want to thank everyone here for uh, coming out to attend and I hope participate in this forum. We all hope that you will have an uh, enjoyable, interesting, and thought-provoking uh, 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 panel discussion with us today. Change happens. I know that all of you, you may even have it on your bumper sticker, probably have seen a bumper sticker that has a more colloquial description of that. Change happens. Probably while you're sitting at the uh, uh, stoplight and reading that bumper sticker in front of you and contributing to uh, global climate change. Well, we're here today to tell you that climate change happens. It has occurred all through the geologic past, and it will continue to, to occur as long as our planet remains a dynamic system. And believe you me, we want this planet to remain a dynamic system, and we want it to remain a water-dominated system, because a static planet and one without water resources is not hospitable to humans at all. The solar system are full of examples. We have Mars and Venus, who are static terrestrial planets. We have uh, Saturn, which is a wonderful, huge, gaseous planet, but that environment is hostile to human beings. We, as a human species, occupy a very special niche in the geologic time of planet Earth. It is unlikely, most likely impossible, that our species would have been able to live earlier in the 4.5 billion year history of the planet. This planet has not always been dominated by a nitrogen, oxygen-rich atmosphere, nor has the mineral, water, always been dominant at the surface and particularly in the liquid form. As Earth has evolved geologically, that dynamic planet I refer to, then we have had a different environment specifically. We have had environments that have fostered many species that were perfectly adapted and very specific to these different environments. Dr. Bishop will describe some of these previous occupants of Oregon to you today. So where are those organisms, those plants and animals now? Well, the secret to surviving climate change is adaptability, and I expect a little dumb luck, too. These organisms did adapt or evolve if necessary, then they are still around in one form or another. The organisms that couldn't or didn't change because a change occurred too fast, the change was too far-reaching, or the species were simply too specialized to their environment are now extinct, and there's only a very few record of them. As a matter of fact, the fossil record preserves a very, very small uh, information on the number of organisms and species that have existed here before us. 
How are we going to adapt to changes in our climate, uh, climatic environment, whether caused by geologic or other factors? Humans have the unique ability to mechanically alter their environment as well as organically offer, altering it. We have unlimited tools at our disposal to implement changes in how we live. That said, we don't have the unlimited ability to change climate back once climate change has begun. We will have to use our knowledge and skills to adapt to what's going to come before us. For Oregon and for now, uh, the state of Oregon has set in motion a series of programs to react to the increase of greenhouse gases, which is one specific part of an overall climate change environment. The governor has identified and the legislator ratified a series of laws aimed toward reducing our energy consumption and dependence on fossil fuels. We um, we will now be seeking renewable energy resources to, for all state-run agencies and organizations, and eventually 25% of all energy uses in the state will come from renewable energy resources. This will reduce our overall carbon footprint and will instigate further changes in our energy consumptive habits as well as decentralizing our energy production and open, opening new economic opportunities. Based on the recommendation of Governor Kulongoski's Climate Change Integration Group, the state will have an Oregon Global Warming Commission to assess the effect of global warming on the economy of Oregon. I think more importantly, though, that we, in the long haul, there will also be an Institute on Climate Change at OSU to integrate climate change science and to advise policymakers on further actions. Down the line, we are looking at changes, overall changes in the geography and the climate of our state. We're looking at changes in the coastline, we're looking at changes in our basic weather patterns, our agricultural activities, and our land use in general. First, we have to have and we have to develop a working hypothesis on what those changes may be. And Dr. Nolan will speak to some ideas the scientific community has regarding Oregon's changing climate. And then we have a choice. We can develop pro policies to be proactive to the knowledge of change, or we can remain reactive to those changes after they already occur. Our, really, our very survival as a species may really depend on that. Finally, I am struck by comments I hear all the time on the radio and TV, but primarily the radio, from both local and national news commentators. They'll start a story or a report on a new science or fact or finding, and now something new on the war on climate change. Oh, have you heard the latest on the war on climate change? <laughs> well, I, I just have to tell you, we're not going to win a war on climate change. <laughs> we need to learn to change our attitude about that. We need to be able to use the skills and tools we have, the enormous skills and tools we have, to look at how we can adapt to the consensus and the understanding. We can use our past geologic and climate change activity, and with that, we can move forward and we will survive. Thank you. Okay, fasten your seat belts. We're doing 700 million years in five minutes. Um, thank you all for coming. It's really a privilege to speak to the City Club members and to the audience um, broadly throughout Oregon. And thank you very much for your attention to this very, very critical issue and very, very critical problem. The accelerating recognition of climate change really marks the rise of a new paradigm and new priorities for the 21st century. And yet, despite its critical import and impact, many Oregonians are truly unsure of climate change's mechanisms, effects, past history, and may even doubt its reality. But the record, according to the 2,500 scientists of the International Panel on Climate Change, is now unequivocal. And it's hard to get 2,500 scientists to use a word like unequivocal all at the same time. In 1939, facing a mounting threat, 
Winston Churchill noted, study the past if you would define the future. The well-documented climate shifts of the geologic past and their dire consequences bear an ominous message for those who fiddle while the planet warms. While climate change throughout geologic history has been a complex process that involves oceans, continental configurations, as well as atmosphere, the predominant mechanism, or at least a predominant mechanism, that has driven past global warming is geologically abrupt and enormous emissions of greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane. But, you may say, there were no SUVs 250 million years ago, or 210 million years ago, or even 55 million years ago. So where did the greenhouse gas come from? How can we determine with any certainty the mechanisms and consequences of such ancient events? Well, technology has befriended us because geologists now can look with some degree of certainty at past atmospheric compositions. We've documented past global temperatures using a proven geothermometer, stable oxygen isotopes. You guys got yourselves in for this when you invited three scientists to do a panel, <laughs> um, which is the ratio of oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. That'll be on the quiz on your way out. Um, atmospheric carbon, carbon dioxide, and methane is measured with the dual parameters of stab stable carbon isotopes and leaf stomata, those little breathing holes that plants use. In addition, paleontologists can tell by the types of plants, leaf forms, animal species, and physiology whether the climate was warm or cold worldwide. Ancient soils and sediments tell us whether the place was arid or moist, and whether precipitation fell throughout the entire year or in monsoonal fashion or not at all. Mars soils, in fact, are, as we speak, being analyzed for their clay compositions to determine past CO2 compositions in the Martian atmosphere based on clay thermodynamics and the mineral compositions and atmospheric composition relations. We won't do the equations today, though. So let's look very briefly, very briefly, at at least three well-documented extinctions that at least in part were driven by intense episodes of global warming. And this, the diagram on your table, and for those on, in the radio audience, you can imagine a, a jaggedy line going up and down across a small piece of paper. Um, basically is a, is a very simplified record of the climate, but it does get the idea across, I think, that where you see a rapid shift in climate, whether that's cooling or warming, organisms often can't adapt. So here's what the geologic record says. To observe ultimate global warming, you need only visit the Permian time period, the rocks in Hell's Canyon, perhaps on a Tuesday some 250 million years ago, and to put 250 million years in perspective, that's really only 5%, the last 5% of geologic time. So you'll find a planet where atmospheric carbon dioxide and methane approach 4,000 parts per million. Oxygen is just 12% of the atmosphere, according to Peter Ward and others, and where more than 90% of life is gone, a nearly dead planet. The greenhouse gas and sulfur aerosols came from the eruption of a vast basaltic province, the Siberian Traps, in, now in Siberia, um, where basically 300,000 square miles were covered by basaltic eruptions. It's estimated that daily temperatures exceeded 160 degrees. Precipitation was virtually absent and based on the lack of plant fossils and sand dune-like sediments. Matt Zafino's forecasts would have been very different indeed. <laughs> Triassic. Let's go to 210 million years ago. A sudden spike of global warming and atmospheric malaise was caused basically by the eruption, simultaneous eruption of a mid-Atlantic ridge volcanic province that went from Brazil to Newfoundland. Basalts carry enormous amounts of carbon dioxide. Plant stomata and carbon isotopes suggest that atmospheric carbon dioxide re reached at least 2,000 parts per million, and acidic seas and changes in ocean temperatures eliminated 40 to 50% of marine and terrestrial species. 
Let's go ratchet up to, a, let's come a little closer to today. The Paleocene and Eocene extinction, 55 million years ago. We can see evidence for that near Pendleton, or at least evidence for the climate. If you were to visit Pendleton 55 million years ago, you would find the equivalent of a Mississippi Bayou or the Everglades. Bald cypress shaded coastal swamps and palms grew on higher ground. Best estimates for the amount of carbon dioxide released by enormous eruptions in the North Sea um, are about 4.5 trillion tons of carbon over 10,000 years. Global temperatures rose by 8 to 12 degrees, and the water at the North Pole was a balmy 70 degrees. More than 40% of marine species vanished. Marsupial animals, which were very popular at the time, suffered about a 90% loss. Many plant species vanished or radically shifted their ranges. Because CO2 has a long residence time, we know that it took between 80 and 100,000 years to return to pre-eruption CO2 levels, which were already high. And I should mention that the Paleocene event was triggered over, over 10,000 years. At our present rate of CO2 production, we are injecting the same 4.5 trillion tons in just 300 years, according to James Zakos of the UC Santa Cruz. So from all this data, there are three things to keep in mind. First, greenhouse gas does affect the climate and life on Earth dramatically and sometimes lethally. Second, greenhouse gas is being added to the atmosphere today at geologically unprecedented rates, at rates at which we've demonstrated from the geologic past that ecosystems do not adapt very well. And third, while volcanoes played the villains in the past, today we are the sole major source of greenhouse gas. There are no flood basalt eruptions covering 300,000 square miles, no vast crustal rents that extend halfway around the globe. Pogo was right. Jane Lubchenco's stirring talk here a year ago provided sage advice. If society wishes to avoid catastrophic disruption of our lives, the time for action is now. Oregon's past and the geologic record seem strong motivation to heed these words. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor and, and a pleasure to be here. This is the first time that I've been at City Club, and it's really a great group. Thank you, Richard and, and Don, for this invitation. I'm going to be talking today about Oregon's present climate, characterizing it, the climate, which we all know and enjoy, at least this time of year, and also uh, projections for future climates. Present day Oregon climate is characterized by gradients, change over space and time. Driving east along Highway 20 from Sweet Home to Sisters, you'll cross the steepest precipitation gradient of anywhere in North America. The north-south orientation of both the Oregon coastline and the Cascades are responsible for this spatial gradient. And so our climate is directly tied to the movement of plate boundaries and the formation of our iconic stratovolcanoes. Our current climate is also governed by the strong seasonality of precipitation. And I use the term precipitation because it encompasses both snow and rain. Our precipitation gradient is nearly a duality with wet winters and dry summers. And this means that when farmers, fish, and thirsty communities need it most, we have the least amount of water. Winter dominant precipitation also means that on the west side of the Cascades, in the high Cascades, a substantial amount of yearly precipitation falls as snow which acts like a bank to store the water until later in the year when it's drier and it begins to melt. Snow in the mountains is like having a reservoir, but without a dam. So I'm a snow hydrologist and a climatologist and an avid skier. And when I moved here from Colorado nearly five years ago, I thought Oregon snow was as boring as it gets. Uniformly heavy and almost always close to the melting point. <clears throat> And while I found that this is true, it also makes for a compelling story of climate change. I learned that Oregon snow is more susceptible to global warming than nearly any other region in the country. 
And any small increase in winter temperature means that the snow line shifts upward, about 150 meters for every single degree Celsius of temperature increase. Snowfall is going to turn to rainfall. We've already seen that in, Colorado, in uh, California. And snowpacks melting earlier, and we have seen that across the American West. No more free reservoir storage. Over the past five years, we've already seen evidence of warmer temperatures, or sorry, over the past five decades, we've seen evidence for warmer temperatures. Flowering trees blooming earlier, peak flows in our mountain streams occurring earlier, and summer low flows, that summer low flow period lasting longer. Wildfires across the western U.S. have increased both in size and intensity, and the fire season is substantially longer than it was just 20 years ago. Our neighbors up in British Columbia have seen their pine forests decimated by bark beetles that used to take two summers to reproduce, but can now do so in one year due to longer summers. And what of the future? Climate models are in good agreement that temperatures will continue to increase by roughly 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit by mid-century and 6 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit by 2090 in the Pacific Northwest. And precipitation in our region is expected to increase by about 10 percent, potentially 20 percent in the winter, and also a small decrease in the summer. But how exactly will these changes be expressed? Global climate models are effective at broad brush projections, but regional scale changes are not well characterized. It's unlikely that we're going to see a uniform shift in weather. Rather, we should expect more overall variability, more extreme events. Our climate future may not resemble our recent climate past. Will we see more large storms, such as the devastating Pineapple Express that pummeled the region last November? Will we swelter through more frequent and more intense summer heat waves? Will there be longer and more frequent high pressure systems that force accumulation of pollution over our cities and valleys? Will low elevation snowpacks continue to disappear and the ski areas along with them? Will rivers see more winter floods but drier summers? And what will happen with our groundwater supplies? These are the regional questions we need to be asking the physical scientists. And from a policy perspective, they're equally important regional scale questions. How will climate change considerations be incorporated into the renegotiation of the Columbia River Treaty in 2014? How will climate change affect economic and social fabrics of rural communities in Oregon, who are disproportionately dependent on natural resources and therefore least able to absorb economic impacts of climate change? How do we make decisions that are balanced and informed in the long run, but wise and resilient in the long run? We don't have the answers to these questions, but more importantly, we're not actively seeking these answers on a coordinated scale. We're using a piecemeal approach, a local approach, not a regional coordinated scale approach. We need hydrologic and ecological observatories that span our gradients from the Cascades to the coast and include important regions on the eastern side of the Cascades as well. Moreover, we don't have a coordinated and effective information portal to transfer these scientific findings. Our resource managers, rural planners, and legislators need to be able to tap into the best available knowledge that will help them develop appropriate strategies rather than simply responding to the latest threat. And I'll end by saying that to succeed in a world of changing climate requires action, action to acquire critical information, action by citizens and policymakers to understand and use that information, and action by our government structures to become more resilient in the face of uncertainty. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that Ellen mentioned the, uh, the water temperatures at the North Pole during uh, ancient times. Um, on July 21st, National Public Radio reported some disturbing news from the North Pole. Endurance swimmer Gordon Pugh became the first person in recent memory to swim at the North Pole using, uh, wearing only his Speedo, a cap, and goggles. He did this to raise awareness of global warming. So my first question to the panel, and I've got two of them, and then our board host has a question. 
uh, <clears throat> is about adaptation to climate change. Uh, and uh, the, I think this relates to how, uh, what the state of Oregon uh, might do as we adapt to that. What are the two most important things that Oregon communities can do to prepare for the impacts of global warming? And I think Vicki is going to lead off on this question. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, I, I'm going to give uh, some specific, general and, and specific information on this. But for, first and foremost, uh, what communities at all levels, both from the local all the way to the state level needs to do, are they need to work with the scientific community and the decision-making community need to be working hand in hand. That means both the scientists and in particular the uh, communities need to reach out to each other and sit down at the table and figure out some of the asking some of these hard questions like Ellen asked and seeing how we can uh, determine to build resiliency because it's really what it's about. Um, I'll, I'll say quickly that in my observations with humans and with communities, we tend to think that we can fix anything. And if we just, if we don't like the valley where it is, we move a mountain and make a, make a, a we get rid of the valley and make it a mountain. And we really need to look more at resiliency and adaptation. Um, the other thing that I highly suggest is that communities need to take stock of their environmental assets and liabilities because you need to understand where you sit in the geography of the state and in the region. Um, for, and one of the greatest examples I can think of, and, and uh, Anne mentioned this, is that if we have a change in our snowpack, we may have the same amount of precipitation that's occurring across the state, but if it's all coming in spring rain instead of winter snowpack, the communities that are out there that depend on that snowpack as their water for the rest of the year are going to have to change the way that they operate or you're not going to be able to continue with the work that you do, both in your population and your agriculture. So it's very important to sit down and have just a really hard, critical look at what your assets and liabilities are. Any, any brief comments on that, Ann or, or Ellen? Thank you. Oh, um, I'll just add to this that the way I think about um, impacts on species and extinctions is, is perhaps not so much towards extinction, but um, the things that we're seeing today in ecosystems, and we can include ourselves in these ecosystems and should, um, what we see are, are range shifts, that we see ranges and entire uh, communities restructuring themselves. So, so species will, in the face of warming, will move to cooler places. Cooler means up in, or higher latitudes, or up in elevation. And what we find, though, is that certain species can't move, okay? They or they move so slowly that the change bypasses them. It changes occurring so quickly they can't adapt to that, or their range becomes so small that they can no longer find an appropriate niche. So, for instance, species that move up in the mountains. Well, notice that mountains rise to a point. There's no more space after a, after a while. So you have these range restrictions, both in terms of latitude. You can only go far so, so far north in the Arctic, and you can only go so far up in the mountains. And one of the issues that we can deal with uh, on a regional scale with community structure is think about how those communities, how those ecosystems function to provide benefits for all of us, whether it's clean water or clean air um, or all kinds of things. And uh, again, as Vis Vicky suggested, consider all of those things in the balance of decisions. Ellen has two words on this. Five words. Think out of the box. Basically, we need creative thought. We need collaboration. Um, and we need to be able to, um, to not only work together, but to recognize that the future really does have challenges. Um, that it's really not going to be the same, and it's a hard thing to recognize. Um, Sam Adams, this is a lot more than two words, isn't it? <laughs> Sam, uh, Sam Adams gave a talk here last week, yes. week before last week, about a new transportation plan. Um, things that can have us not generate CO2 are actually much more effective than figuring out how to take it back out of the atmosphere once it's there. So. Basically, we still need to think out of the box, and now I'll be 
quiet. Uh, uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, we had several other questions here, but uh, in the interest of letting club members and our board host ask them, uh, I will uh, uh, turn it over to Brian, and if we have time, I'll come back to those questions, panelists. <laughs> Asking questions is a privilege of City Club membership, and we would ask that you keep in mind the difference between a question and a statement. Limit your question to 30 seconds or less so you'll get the dreaded question mark sign. And our first question today will be asked by our board host, Brian Campbell. Brian recently retired from the Port of Portland, where he was a planning manager for 15 years and is now a land use and transportation planning consultant with Parsons Brinkerhoff. He graduated from Stanford with a degree in architecture and received his master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Virginia. It's also interesting that he started his planning career, or before he did, he was in the Peace Corps for um, two years working as an architect in Peru. And he's been a city club member for over 11 years. Brian. Uh, thank you, Don, and thank you to the panel for a very enlightening uh, set of uh, statements so far and, and answers the questions. My question has to do with the next generation of leaders. Um, clearly, we've gotten a lot of information from, you know, Al Gore has certainly helped a lot, and uh, the kids are certainly all kind of now um, thinking about this, but what would you suggest that we can do, uh, what the educators can do, what parents can do, what schools, nonprofits, foundations, to prepare that next generation of leaders to uh, really be responsive to this, to be able to take Oregon and the nation to the next level on, uh, in terms of recognition and, and then and, and, uh, and moving on with uh, better, better programs and whatever. Okay, well, I'll take the lead quickly. First, we need sound science education, and many of our schools provide that. But um, al along with that, we need to, to get people and I'll also make a pitch for earth science and geologic history, because if you don't know that 250 million years ago, the planet was nearly exterminated by climate change, um, that's one little piece of information that's kind of scary, that's helpful. But the other thing that we need to do is get outside more. We need to, we need to connect people with the real world. We need to have... Um, we need to take, make sure that our, our young people not only understand the urban environment and not only understand the local forests, but that they see the diversity of ecosystems across the state and they understand those changes and they begin through their science classes and sociology and ability to work with other people because that's another real key here. We have to be able to talk and be civil with one another and recognize we need to find solutions. Um, but we need to look at this as a problem that's more than just, we can't just solve this in Portland. So that's what I'd say. Get outside, think creatively, and talk to one another. Thanks. Don, are you going to take the questions? Could I add just okay. a, a quick one on the, I think that both Ann and I want to just add, I just have a couple of things here. Um, I'm not an educator, but I deal with hiring and firing people, hopefully more hiring than firing people. And I want to tell you what I, what I suggest we need in our educational system is to get back to teaching people how to think critically and how to evaluate information. Because I'll tell you right now, there's so much, we're supposedly the information age, and there is so much information out there right now that's not worth the time it takes to download it from the internet. And people don't understand that. That is absolutely critical. I want to follow up on that. Uh, a lot of people think about climate change and think that there is a big debate about it among scientists. And I just want to say that there is no debate among scientists, that climate change is real and attribution is human. One of the things, I teach a class of several hundred students who are not science majors. I teach a class called The Surface of the Earth at Oregon State. And these are business majors, design majors, sociologists, psychologists, home ec majors, all kinds of stuff. And I teach climate change to them. I teach them, I have to teach them how to think critically about the information that they encounter, mostly on the internet. 
And I use four criteria that a graduate student developed that, at OSU, and I think they're really important. I want to convey these. The first is when you come across a website and you're reading something, and you should write these four down, think about, is the argument that they're making relevant? Are they talking about cycles that aren't even relevant to the increase that we're seeing now in temperature? And secondly, is the information recent? Things that were published five years ago right now are probably out of date. Is the information that's presented been published in a peer-reviewed journal? The peer review process is a cornerstone of, si of the scientific endeavor. And the contrarians for climate change have actually developed their own journal called Energy and Environment because they couldn't get published in the mainstream climate science peer review journal process. They couldn't make it through the peer review process. So they've sidestepped that. And then lastly, look at the website. Is it biased? Are the people being funded by one group or another that would present, give them a biased uh, position um, that they're presenting? So those four criteria, I think, are really helpful in trying to sort through the 87 million websites <laughs> on Google. Thanks. OK, I guess we have time now for uh, club member questions. Ray Polani, a city club member. There is a definite connection between transportation, land use, and energy consumption. Energy consumption is affected very much by dispersed urban settlement. Human urban settlement is fostered by the automobile. Uh, on the other hand, our middle speaker was talking about tools. And public transportation is a tool that could be used very much to focus urban settlement and make it compact. How about shifting resources from pavement to electric public transportation? Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm not a planner, but I absolutely agree. I mean, there, there, are, there are so many advantages or benefits to shifting from the, the sprawl that we have, particularly in America. Our model for cities are urban sprawl in most cases. I won't fault the city I'm living in now. But uh, there certainly needs to be a change, a, a dramatic shift in that. And it really isn't a step backwards, as I read in the editorial about Commissioner Sam Adams the other day. It is a step forward in how, we, how to be smart and how we use things. I, I would totally agree. Next. Kathleen Warman, City Club member. Thank you all for coming today. And I have a two-part question. The Washington Climate Impacts Group claimed that snow in the Cascades had dropped by 50%, but they started their trend in 1950, which was really snowy, and ended it in 1997 during a warm, dry period. Mark Albright pointed out that if they had used the entire record, there is no trend. How do you explain that? And the second part is, NASA and the Russian Federation of Science have both predicted much less intense solar activity from the next two solar cycles. This suggests the possibility of significant cooling. Do you agree? I'll answer both of those. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Phil Mote and the, his colleagues at the Climate Impacts Group at UW um, are correct in their assessment of the changes in snowpack since 1950, not just in Oregon, but across the western United States. And in their publication two years ago, they showed that if the, the reason they used the record just back to 1950 is because the, it wasn't uh, as complete if you go back further. So there were some locations where if you do extend the record back to 1920, you see a change in the pattern by region. So for instance, if you look in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, if you go all the way back to 1920, again, it's a sparse data set back then, but you don't see any substantial change other places in the western United States. Again, no substantial change. The only region in the western US where there was, there was a statistically significant substantial change in snowpack back to the 1920s is the Pacific Northwest. So that is published in the Bureau, uh, in the Bulletin of American Meteorologic Society in 2005. 
The second question about solar cycles is really quite interesting because there was a publication that came out in Nature earlier this year that actually described um, the opposite of what you're saying, and that is that um, while there has been some synchrony between temperature and solar cycles in the past, the most recent solar activity has been opposite to what the temperature change has been. That is, there has been a decrease in solar activity and yet a substantial increase in temperature. And so we are now seeing the difference in the magnitude of the forcings, the things that push our climate. That's saying that the forcing from the sun is much, much, much less, on an order of magnitude less, than forcings from greenhouse gases. And we see this expressed in the temperature record. It's a really interesting paper to take a look at if you're interested. Steve Novick, City Club member. I'm not sure any of you would actually have looked at this, but if you have, I was curious, what impact on our hydropower system will the shrinking snowback that you're describing have? And second, I just have to say that you geologists totally rock. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm left speechless by that. Uh, um, actually, there there have been uh, there have been some studies done, particularly by uh, uh, Bonneville Power and uh, the uh, 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 group that oversees Bonneville, and looking at they have uh, ordered a study on what do they think will affect the hydropower if we do have changes. And it w uh, the the overall look is that there will become issues between when we will be uh, when we when we would have available water to produce power, and when we would have available water to allow for fish fish passage and for the the temperatures that are needed. So yeah, there that is a that is a real concern, and there are uh, there are folks that are also already starting to think about that. Good afternoon, thank you so much for coming. My name is Brian Steensma, City Club member. I'm also a doctor of complex system science and I also have a passion for geology, so I'm very interested to hear your perspective. And I understand that, in my perspective also, that global climate change is occurring and that we are impacting our environment in many ways. Um, I'd just like to get maybe your input, because I hear so many different numbers trying to understand the levels of, of greenhouse gases. Um, for example, what is the percentage of water vapor uh, to CO2 and methane and what percentage of the CO2 as a global greenhouse gas is contributed uh, from our society, from uh, our, our emissions and such. Thank you. Okay. Um, so water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas in terms of its ab uh, abundance and ability to absorb uh, heat and re-radiate. Um, methane is also really critical. CO2 is the one that has been changing the fastest, and uh, carbon isotope studies of CO2 in the atmosphere show that the CO2 increases in the atmosphere are due almost entirely to combustion of fossil fuels and land clearing. Both of those are human caused. So is it possible to quote a percentage on those levels? Not off the top of my head. <laughs> moment the atmosphere we're breathing right now yeah well I, I believe we're at last count at about 385 parts per million um, co2 and up from 280 at the beginning of the industrial revolution so there's no question that we're going up we're we're not at a thousand or fifteen hundred parts per million but we're headed there I'm just curious as a percentage because I don't understand the units uh, percentage would be probably 1%, 2%, some, somewhere in there. Um, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a huge component of the atmosphere, but it's a very significant component. And that's the important thing. Yeah, and, and water vapor and methane. And it's long, it's long residence time is the one thing that makes CO2 a very significant greenhouse gas. Once we put it up there, we have, you know, it's going to be there for 20,000 years, potentially. 
Even if we go back to CO2 levels from the year 2000, we can expect a continued temperature increase on the order of more than half a degree by the end of the next 100 years. So even if we s go back in time, we're still going to see a temperature increase from what's up there. We have, uh, we have time for one more short question. Good afternoon, Tuck Wilson, City Club member. I appreciate the panel's vivid description of the perils we face from climate change. There have been several references to students. I wonder if you're familiar with Focus the Nation. Focus the Nation is a program to focus students across the country on a thousand campuses and universities, particularly those in Oregon, on solutions to climate change. And I know that the students would welcome the participation of experts like yourself. Thank you for sharing this afternoon. Sorry, we don't have time for any more questions, although some of the older City Club members like myself, I'm sure, are wondering, why didn't they have science professors that were in this interesting when we went to college? <laughs> Thank you very much, panel, for a great program. We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>